haystack and the grass here. So um, I hit upon this metaphor because uh, we could talk about a few differences here. You know, there's a lot of grass in the world. Um, when it gets organized, it starts looking like a haystack, and then you have tools to interact with it, like this ladder. So, you know, if this is data, this is a data set. Um, it's got a number of characteristics. It's smaller. It's better organized. It kind of has an interface um, to it. Um, and it becomes useful because it has been uh, gathered, organized, and has an interface. Um, by contrast, what should we do about the situation? Okay, first of all, is there a situation to do anything about here? Is this normal? Is this unusual? What is this even telling me? Are these pipes loud? Hot? Um, the convention is that, you know, cooler is cold, but who knows? Maybe somebody decided cooler is red. <laughs> um, and so, anyway, um, the point is you can collect a lot of data um, but without putting it into context of some kind, it's not actually actionable. Um, I, um, I worked with uh, a gentleman at Autodesk for a while, and uh, for much longer in, than in the building professions. Uh, you can imagine in the technical uh, professions, uh, there's been this, you know, nattering on of shorthand about data, data, data is what's important, data, data. And, um, in response, I uh, sent this to my colleague, and I said, here's some data, go. <laughs> um, and he's like, oh, well, you know, but, yeah, of course. So because it, it only becomes meaningful if you, you know, actually add some meaning to it, a schema, some description of what it is you're looking at. Otherwise, it's just a pile of numbers. So um, what's critical to understand, and of course we're all going to keep using the shorthand of the data is what's important, but it's as you get into organizing um, and making data useful, making it actionable, it's important to remember this distinction because there's a lot of work between data and data set, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So this is a definition of data set. It seems pretty applicable. A collection of related sets of information that is composed of separate elements but can be manipulated as a unit by a computer. Not sure I would necessarily throw a computer at the end of that. Um, manipulated as a unit, of course, data sets have always existed. Um, you know, a ledger from 100 years ago is a data set that describes the financial transactions of a company. But um, it's important to have definitions in mind when you're thinking about this stuff because it, it articulates um, the discussion in a way that lets you all be on the same page when you're talking about things. And once, once you start agreeing on definitions, um, I kind of harp on this a lot, you can actually proceed um, with a lot of shorthand. Um, there's a lot of data out there. Uh, we've been building stuff for 5,000 years. Um, it represents a, an enormous data set that is um, disorganized, uncaptured, um, not actionable usually, except by um, people processing it through the gray matter. Um, there's a lot of these uh, around. Uh, there's enough to paper that entire 5,000-year-old building environment. Um, there's an awful lot of organized data as far as standards go and other types of uh, regulatory constraints and directives. There's a convention center full of academic papers available to you about building, and specifically building and computing. Um, there's an ocean of this stuff. It's also hardly ever looked at, unfortunately. And of course, you know, our old friend books, there's a bunch of stuff in there. And we've got an awful lot of these hanging around. So, um, and now we're gathering more data um, as we start putting sensors in buildings and they start fountaining all sorts of data back to us about building behavior. Um, so you have to ask, well, we're, we're awash in an ocean. What's the problem here? Well, so uh, I had the uh, privilege yesterday of participating uh, in a hackathon. Um, and uh, sponsored by DBEI. And one of the things we tried to do was uh, get some data to work on housing in Seattle. And that took 
five people an afternoon to find and gather the data, and then two other people the next day, several hours, just processing it into a form where it became actionable. This is not an unusual experience. Um, data scientists will tell you that 82% of their time is just getting the data ready to do something with. Um, it is uh, a long and arduous task. Most data is not normalized in any way. A lot of it is not captured, so there's a whole process involved with it. You know, another 13% of their time is actually trying to do something with that data. So look at that proportion. Six times. You can expect this. If you have to deal with existing data, this is what you're going to deal with. And it is often tedious, difficult, expensive, and sometimes impractical. So I want to make you aware of what there's, you know, another way to go about this, not exclusive of these methods of capturing existing data, but one thing you can do is you can just make it. So these are some uh, experiments that I was doing uh, early last year, uh, and this is just a, a Python script that's randomizing up alternatives of a building's site placement. Or, you know, generating alternatives for uh, a site development. And these are all little demos that I did for um, some clients. And it doesn't take long to make this, and they're not very intelligent. Um, but uh, they are really fast and cheap. <coughs> so only just doing some very basic office layouts. Retail layouts. The point being that you can fairly easily come up with pretty realistic data sets using automated processes. In our own work in Hyde Park, um, we do things like this. Just generate developments based on a bunch of rules. With, you know, in this case, a little analysis uh, thrown in as we start playing with uh, what the allowable slope is on these sites. So, um, getting back to our, our, our little data set here, one of the things you can do with when you have gathered some data or in possession of it is you can throw it into an automated process to find out what it implies, in this case, about um, a floor plan layout. So, um, what this does, and I'll explain this, this one in a little more detail because it's illustrative, um, is that it takes this pretty simple, um, uh, pretty simple program and it starts changing up the order in which the rooms are placed. So, first we'll do this one, then we'll place that one, next one according to a number of rules. So, out of that mere mixing, this is the number of possible designs that can come out of that pretty simple algorithm. Um, for those of you more comfortable with scientific notation, um, this is known as uh, 2.63 decillion. I had to look up the number <laughs> uh, name. Um, and uh, I kind of struggled with, like, how do you express how big this number actually is from a very simple set of uh, data? So it is approximately equivalent to the quantity of sand grains on every single beach on 35 Earths. <laughs> and that's 32 room types just changing in order, right? So. Data sets can give you through logic, yes, they produce bounded results, but the bounds are pretty far away <laughs> when you start doing things like this, right? So, you know, the solar system is also a bounded system. Um, uh, so, you know, if, uh, does this help? You know, if design is the process of taking everything you could do, which is maybe anything, and getting it down to what you actually do, uh, a process like this, gee, thanks so much, 
um, you've now made it infinity, maybe minus one, right? But um, there are other characteristics of this kind of approach about finding this needle of the thing you want to do. Uh, the characteristic of generative processes, you know, who's ever doing them, is that what, one of the things they do is they produce normalized data. And this is, in this case, this is some JSON. It could be, you know, CSVs or anything. But as I'm sure most of you know, because you're here today, you know, this is catnip to an automated process of analysis, right? This is the exact thing you need before you do something important to try to figure out what your next decision is going to be. Um, that provides the ability to kind of characterize a problem and let you start if it's about solutions or direction, you know, sorting things according to various expressed criteria. And of course, you know, this is the exact kind of thing you want to have around if you're interested in doing machine learning. If you are just thinking about machine learning or um, you're in it, you know that it's really about pattern recognition. That's what it does well. Um, so you have to think about your problems um, and whether they are amenable to that. But at least you start with something that is amenable to pattern recognition. There's also the ability to do qualitative data um, and quantify it. So this is some um, work <coughs> pardon me, um, from uh, uh, Natalia Bach. And at the Menace Institute, and after doing a study where she met, she established that people's experience of real rooms was analogous to their experience of VR rooms, so she established the baseline that this was actually a good methodology, she sticks people in VR and starts moving walls and ceilings around and asking them, how does this make you feel? <laughs> right in the environment, right? And so she's turning this qualitative emotional experience into actionable data by interacting with folks in a controlled environment, which is replayable. So, you know, I talked about pattern pattern recognition, and this is kind of the more one of the more important things about generative processes in my in my mind. Um, the more you see things, the more you have a chance to recognize a pattern uh, to perhaps get to a point where you can make a quicker decision because you understand things. Um, generative processes have a way of producing lots and lots of things that may have a pattern, either you know logically in there or emergent from analytical behavior. Um, and you know, right now in the building professions, you know, we expect folks like this to become mature in their profession in about 20 years, which as those of you who have been kicking around the industry know, means that some people will trust you with some special decisions sometimes. Right? 20 years to get to that point. And it's not, it's nobody's fault. Buildings are complicated. There's a lot of stuff involved in dealing with it, and it's hard for any single person to grasp it. That's why we have teams. Right? But 20 years, that's a long apprenticeship. Right. So, you know, imagine if people can see lots and lots of stuff and understand how it behaves, does that build their professional intuition? You know, what if you could shorten this arc from 20 years to 10? How much more productive would we be as a profession to build that expert intuition to make those decisions? So we're doing both things. We're not, it's not just about automating processes and getting to results. It's about training the people working with the processes. So um, I'm going to recommend a few books at the end. One of them is The Second Digital Turn uh, by Mario Carpo. He's a uh, really super intelligent academic. I've met him a couple times. He's a great, great person. But this is, this is true. Today we can make him break on the screen. In a few hours, more full-size trials than traditional craftsmen would have made and broken in a lifetime. And every trial is a learning experience. And now you can do basically an infinite number of them. So. Uh, your reading. The Second Machine Age, the Digital Term, Architecture Design Data by Phil Bernstein, who will be speaking at the BUILD conference this year, uh, um, keynote. And uh, finally, you know, a book we kind of consider our Bible at High Park, which is The Future of the Professions. These are two sociologists who um, study how the professions are. Oh, great. It's one in the audience. I'll be giving two of those <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Great. Uh, it's a terrific book. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, The Future of the Professions, there isn't one. <laughs> uh, 
speaking. Um, but you have about, you probably, at least for their prediction, you have about 50 years or so left. Um, and what it means is, what they really mean is that the professions are going to change fundamentally, and it's going to be around processes like this. So it's important to have things in your toolbox when you're dealing and trying to make decisions that will round out when you lack uh, data, either you lack the data or you lack it in a data set form that's easy to uh, understand. You know, or you just stay all week, you know, um, instead of reading the books. But um, I highly recommend doing both. So thank you. Um, I have, I guess I have a few minutes for questions on this, which is great. Um, and I'll be, I'll be around all week. Does anybody have any questions, comments, insults they'd like to call? Um, <laughs> it's all the beaches. <laughs> oh yeah, here we are. Yeah, so with your data sets that you that you plug in to be able to push out options, yeah. have you found a breaking point at which there is there are too many parameters that are going in there that then start making things all pieces, or is it pretty? It, it um depending on how many uh, factors, there's, there was some good work going on at Autodesk uh, a few years ago. They were starting to look into this stuff. And they found uh, in the research groups that once you've got past 20 influencing factors, the processing time, could, but it, it sort of depends. If, if the factors are all influencing one another, uh, it, it can get pretty uh, exponential. If they're not, and they're just being uh, inputs, it, it's pretty scalable. Um, we, we, we do some things with like, you know, 40 inputs, um, but they're not all kind of churning through and influencing one another. So it's, it matters like how much you're adjusting other factors with individual factors. Um, I mean, one of the reasons that um, you know, we're, we and other companies are uh, doing things in the cloud is that you know, you're not processor bound anymore, right? And if you can take a problem like that and slice it up and distribute it, then you, you can distribute it infinitely. Right, so pretty much. So that's that's one kind of tool at, at these approaches. I mean, you have a lot of stuff to process. Is there a way to divide up the problem and distribute it uh, through multiple CPUs? And that, that can get you. Because we, we talked uh, yesterday at the uh, hackathon, and one of the teams said, oh, well, we thought, well, we thought we'd like let something run overnight and generate 10,000 options. I'm like, um, you know, you don't have to do that overnight. You can do it in a couple of seconds, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, I, there's there are scalability issues, but it's a lot more about the design of the algorithm and how the data set is constructed. Um, and you get a pretty early indication if if it's just gonna knock itself up and leap in the corner. Yeah. So thank you, Anthony. All right, I think we're out. Thanks thank so you. Very interesting presentation by Anthony. Our next presenter is Doug Williams, and he works at Leo Daily, and it'll take him a minute or so to, to swap things out. Doug has been a database several times over the years. So.